Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Vagam Radian at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., where we have run into an old friend of mine, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, uh, formerly of CSIS, but also the first American ambassador in Myanmar in 22 years, resetting, obviously, the strategic relationship with that con uh, country. You're with Albright uh, Stonebridge Group, uh, U.S. Institute of Peace, and also uh, advising here at CSIS. Great yeah. to see you. Great to see you, Vago. Um, the, I wanna, the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, obviously the massive challenge of resetting a relationship with which, uh, you know, with a country that had bad relationships with just about everybody, yeah. uh, with the exception of, of, of China and a handful of other, uh, other countries. Um, what were some of the key challenges, and what are some in, in sort of start restarting the relationship? Mm -hmm. But also, what are some of the challenges that the country still faces. You know, Aung San Suu Kyi is, is back as the leader, is the leader of the country, but there are also significant challenges that still exist. Yeah, there, I mean, it's remarkable change. We never, I would never have expected when I started as envoy and then became ambassador that we would have seen anything like we've seen. And I know it's made international headlines and you have the democracy leader heading the country. It's, you know, another one of those democracy success stories. But what people don't understand is, I mean, those are sort of the headlines. But the fundamental challenges of this country are immense. Uh, we used to think of it as an easy country. It was the lady in the junta, you know, this Nobel Peace Prize woman, uh, you know, award-winning woman, mm -hmm. and the junta. Um, so that's easy to understand. But as you open the place up, you realize it has the lar longest running civil war in the world. It has religious challenges. It has tremendous divisions and nobody trusts anybody in 50 years of systematic degradation of every institution in the country. So. With all of that, we have to keep our eye on this. These are people that really love the United States. So what I found is they really want to reach out to us. The expectations on us are quite high. They're in a very strategic location. They're at the crossroads of Asia between a dynamic South Asia and a dynamic Southeast and East Asia. So we need to keep engaged with eyes wide open, but recognizing how far they've come, but also recognizing the, the role that we can play in helping them get to the next phase as real partners. What do you think uh, this new administration, I mean, obviously it's been a year since you left the country, uh, you left uh, uh, Myanmar, but what are, what are the, some of the things that the new incoming administration can do to build on that success? Again, the Obama look, administration looked at Burma as that strategic bridge uh, for, for the nation, obviously rekindling, you know, warming relations with India at the same time, sort of resetting the dynamic, uh, which was a blow to Beijing because it looked at, at, at Myanmar as, as a friendly client. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things the new administration has to do there? Well, let me just also say it wasn't simply a strategic move in terms of China or any other country. We had longstanding interests, uh, according to our values of democracy and human rights, and supporting them to evolve into something that, you know, it was more stable and was akin to what we would like to see writ large. I mean, the, the challenge, the defining challenge, I would say, of Asia is what are the norms, what are the values that will succeed in the coming century that are being challenged by countries in Southeast Asia as well as China and others. So Burma was part of that. Myanmar was part of that. Um, look, we, we, have, um, we have a role to play, I think, uh, as a new administration to just continue to be engaged, to help them on um, the grassroots level, to build an agricultural economy, to build a manufacturing economy, to help build their capacity in education and health. Um, uh, we also are concerned about their historic relationship with North Korea. Uh, so we can build on all these things that we've laid the groundwork for. Um, but I think we should just not forget about them. I don't know that President Trump has to give it the attention that President Obama did. I think it's important as well that we set an example. They really look to us as a model. So if we speak uh, in ways that are not consistent with our values in terms of religions, uh, Islam and others, that can really hurt us in that country um, with what we're looking for, which is true reconciliation and, and peace and stability. So we have to be careful to do no harm in what's going on there, but build on the foundations of institutional development that we've started. You were, um, obviously, you've been an, uh, an expert on Asia throughout your career, um, spent the first two years of the Obama administration in the Pentagon, where you were the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia. Um, obviously, another dynamic time when the Pacific pivot and all of that stuff started, and obviously then you were envoy and then, and then ambassador. Stepping back now, you know, what do you see as um, the, was the pivot as successful? Uh, you know, some have obviously criticized it, but you were, you were there at its inception and in the early age, but, you know, part of its implementation. You know, ultimately, was the pivot something that you regard as a success? I do, for this reason, it's a pivot or it's the rebalance, or what I originally heard was they talked about the turn to Asia when we were in government and sitting in the sit room, they said the turn to Asia became sort of the pivot. I don't see it as an Obama 
thing necessarily. I think he, he was the first to really give it attention. He was the first Asian president, in essence, someone who really understood. There's a lot of talk about the Asian century. He made it real in terms of going to every ASEAN country, giving it time, giving it attention, and putting that, that moniker on it. But it wasn't simply an Obama policy. It was, it was a recognition of the importance of this region to the United States. So regardless of what administration there is, I think there will be more and more attention on Asia because it's, it's just recognizing reality, our economic reality, our security reality, our political reality, whatever you call it. And it wasn't meant to be something that would be done in four years or eight years. It was the beginning of a decade, decades-long process of successive administrations, a long-term effort to uh, just acknowledge the reality of the importance of this region to give it the time it deserves. So I think it continues. I don't think it was a failure. I wouldn't say huge success as if it was going to, ha and, you know, something would be obvious in four years. But uh, I think we're going to continue to see Asia as a critical component of our foreign policy for the foreseeable future. Obviously, almost everything the Obama administration sought to do was in a multilateral framework. Uh, you know, spend some more time, invest, obviously, in the NATO alliance, looking at NATO and bringing those countries together, but also in Asia to build a multilateral framework, yeah. both as a tool to... Uh, put more pressure on China, uh, but as well as a tool to figure out what are some on-ramps to get China in to pull it more closely into the international uh, order. Um, and I think that that was, a, you know, a common philosophy, right? China's entrance uh, onto the Arctic Council as an observer was threatening to some, but deliberately done by the member nations to say, hey, look, now you've got skin in the game. Now you have to follow our rules. Mm -hmm. This administration, the Trump administration, has said America first. Um, yeah. You know, we were in a panel uh, here yesterday with a lot of Japanese experts, mm -hmm. a lot of concern about what that potentially means. Right. Um, you've lived, traveled in virtually every nation in that region right. uh, and also engaged with them on, on, on a whole bunch of security dialogues and you still remain engaged in the region. You know, what are the potential implications of this uh, America First policy? How is it being perceived? You know, John Hammer yesterday, the uh, the boss here at CSIS made him unclear. clear. He's like, you know, I've been in national security for 40 years, and every president in the 40 years that I've been in this game has been committed to America First. Nobody's just actually said that uh, as, as a slogan. Mm -hmm. What are the potential implications and what are the challenges when where do you think the new administration has to tread carefully and where do you think it can take some more risk? Well, we need to exercise leadership. I don't think there's any alternative to American leadership um, in the world and in Asia particularly. I mean, that doesn't mean we go it alone, which is what I think President Obama uh, demonstrated in the way he conducted the foreign policy in, in Asia in particular, which is that we can lead. People will look to us to lead uh, and gather, but we're not doing this alone. Uh, America first, fine. America has to take care of its interests, no doubt about it. A president has to be answerable to you know the voters and the citizens, first of all. But it's not America only, not America alone, and America can't go it alone. So when you go overseas and you think about our position at home and, and our security, it can't be done just in our borders. We have to be engaged. We have to be shaping. We have to think about the norms, the values, the rules, the laws by which uh, the international community operates, because those aren't simply for others. Those are really done for ourselves. And that's the real question mark is how much those uh, issues will be addressed by this current administration, uh, what rules they want to be, abide by. Uh, we have benefited from establishing uh, those rules in the post-World War II era, and I don't think, I think it's just a, a law of international conduct that those types of things uh, work to our benefit. Those are at risk now because of the rise of other great powers, including China, but others, and Russia and others. We have to be out there shaping and um, cultivating our alliances, cultivating our partnerships. And the more countries that are with us on these norms and rules, the more we will be secure. Where do you put, how important is the decision to break the TPP? Obviously what Donald Trump did was put the, the final nail in a coffin that was being built for quite some time. You know, the, the, the administration had a full year to try to get it through Congress. Congress showed no appetite to drive that through, obviously because of some of the rhetoric on the campaign trail right. in, in, in right. part. but. You know, what, what are the implications of the U.S. pulling out of this agreement, and what do you see for its future, and how do you see China taking advantage of that, which it's been ready to do? Well, I'm two minds on this. First of all, certainly I supported TPP. And in Asia, you know, American credibility stands on two legs. It stands on the economics and trade portion, open markets and trade, and on our security posture. They, they want us around. They want to see us committed, and they feel without us there would be a, a vacuum uh, that could be filled by others. So we've lost one leg of that, and the question is, what will 
replace that. Um, it certainly hurts us. I think it'll hurt us economically as a country. Um, but aside from that strategic level, I think it does then create questions about American commitment. But on the other hand, I do think that in Asia, there is a need for the United States. Uh, there is a recognition that the United States is critical. So countries will also think about how to make up for this, I would think. Now, again, it's not ideal, but um, you know, they, they support us because it's in their interest to have an offshore balancer and some, so they don't have to completely be beholden to the large power to the north in China. So we have to figure out how to mitigate the damage. Uh, it has done damage to our position. Uh, and we simply have to think of what the plan B will be. And I don't think the plan B for the countries in the region will be simply turning to China. And do you think that bilateral agreements will work? Or do you think the TPP survives, as some suggest, with Japan and Australia perhaps yeah. in the lead to keep it together as a, as a trade bloc? Yeah, and that's my view generally about folks in Asia and you know, our allies. Is Basically, I tell them, hold on, please you know, <laughs> carry on without us for a little while uh, just to see where things go, and then we'll be back. Um, look, I think there needs but, to be a lot. But can, but can we be back? I mean, there are some people who, who look at this and say, look, you know, uh, w you know, when the relationship is rocky, but if you get to a point of a divorce proceeding, it may be harder to put things back together. And then folks find themselves in a very different place in four years, oh, absolutely. especially with the rising Abe, oh, yeah. Korea with challenges. Oh, no, no, I'm terrified of what, <laughs> what can be done in four years. Absolutely. We have to be very concerned that a lot of damage that would be very difficult to rectify can occur in four years. That said, I think our job is to try to mitigate, mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, to, to say, look, most American people believe in free trade. They believe in these trade agreements, even if it doesn't show up in, the, in, the, uh, in um, you know, Michigan or some of the key states. Overall, people understand the benefits of this. There needs to be more work done, I think, at home. And one of the things I want to do personally, actually, is less talk overseas and more talk to people at home about what we're thinking, what we're doing, and why we think it's in the interest of the United States and engage in conversation with Americans about these things. Um, so we have work to do at home to, to get this right in the next four years. But, um, you know, I, I'm not willing to give up yet. I, you know, I, I think that uh, America is still going to be a very strong economy. It's going to be crucial to the economic growth and the stability and security of Asia. Uh, I don't think they will give up on us. And I think those of us outside of government and loyal opposition as Democrats or loyal opposition as Republicans who are not crazy about Trump can can do much to try to mitigate what can, as you say, create a lot of harm in four years. Derek, thanks very, very much, and best of luck. Thank you, Rago.